Just a bit of a recap about miners, uh, their invasion in Australia, and uh, what really is the lived experience of people and why people uh, dislike these birds. I want to then sort of refer a little bit to what's happened overseas, and we've heard a bit of that from uh, Susanna, uh, and that really tells a different story about if we let miners run wild, what can happen. Uh, I then want to actually talk about some of the models for dealing with this pest bird, uh, and we'll talk about a lot more of that in the afternoon plenary session. But just to recap a little bit about uh, the miners uh, into Australia. As you know, they were introduced in the 1860s, again, really to control insects that failed, but they were taken to North Queensland to get rid of the cane beetles. So clearly that uh, worked well because they had introduced the cane toad in 1938. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly we had the same problem with cane toads as we had with um, uh, Indian miners dealing with the uh, cane beetle. Only brought to Canberra 100 years later. And that's really quite instructive because that actually tells us, as we've heard already, that miners don't move very quickly through the landscape. Uh, and these were deliberately introduced into Canberra. So 100 years after being introduced into Melbourne, they arrived here. Uh, that's very important for us in terms of the control methods that we can adopt to, uh, to slow their progress. But now, unfortunately, they're way across the eastern seaboard. And all of you, no doubt, heard that uh, uh, six weeks ago they were reported as, as arriving in Devonport uh, on the ferry from Melbourne. Um, and uh, it was only because of the, uh, uh, the, the bird uh, knowledge of one of the passengers who saw this bird hop off the, the ferry at Devonport that was reported. So if one's come by the ferry from Melbourne, that probably means there's others. Anyway, Tasmania are, are on to that. Now, I'll just give you a little bit of a refresher on the lived experience of the community in terms of why they uh, uh, don't like this bird. And this is an experience, I guess, is now given some scientific basis uh, in the uh, literature by Kate Grarock and others here in Australia. But it is the lived experience and the scientific basis that has been be behind the IUCN listing this bird as the third most as the, one of the three most invasive bird species in the world. So they haven't done that for sparrows. They haven't done that for a range of other invasive birds. They've done that for miners, bulbuls, and starlings because they are three birds that are deleterious to native wildlife. So the lived experience of communities. Uh, and the knowledge of environmentalists is that these birds are a threat to native wildlife. Outcompete birds for nesting hollows, we've heard that from Kate again this morning. They feed on uh, chicks, etc., and we'll hear more of that uh, as we talk this afternoon about the impact of, of miners in the, uh, overseas. Drive out small birds in gardens, and this is the one thing that really irritates uh, people who, in Canberra particularly, when miners in any numbers come into their backyard or take up residence in their local area, the small birds vanish. And this is the one thing, particularly in Canberra, that people get absolutely pissed off about. The other thing they get pissed off about is the noise, uh, but we'll deal with that later. But here, from environmental impact, environmental threat, we see the threat is really being rosellas, and their work by uh, Chris Titterman and his researchers on Black Mountain in the 1990s uh, really sort of uh, nailed that one. When miners were competing with crimson rosellas for nesting sites on Black Mountain, the Indian miner won out 50% of the time. When they were competing with eastern rosellas, a smaller rosella, uh, when they were competing with eastern rosellas for a nesting hollow, the miners won out 100% of the time. Now, some of that work's been replicated in Kate's, uh, Kate's uh, research, uh, but bear in mind that eastern rosellas are birds of woodlands. They're not birds normally of urban areas. But we also have a concern about the impact on endangered species like lizards and uh, uh, insects. Now, a lot of people don't actually give much uh, recognition or thought about these, but these are, bird, these are uh, parts of our ecosystem, our web of life, that really are important uh, uh, environmentally. We also have a concern that miners, like bell miners, the bell bird down the, down the south coast, can actually, uh, by driving out the small insectivorous birds, actually have an impact on the health of the ecosystem in terms of removing those birds uh, from doing their insect gleaning uh, activities. 
The international experience, and this is what I really uh, find frustrating in Australia, the international experience is quite clear. Where miners are around, you have a quite deleterious impact uh, on uh, native species. And the Pacific Islands and all the islands really sort of uh, clarify that, where you have confined spaces, big populations of miners, no chance of recruitment for native birds outside from that particular area. But the international experience is that miners have led to the demise or decline of the Mangawa kingfisher. Now, this photo is taken by Gerald McCormack. We, we uh, were in touch with him a couple of days ago. He confirmed again that the Mangawa kingfisher, 25% of the nesting failures of this bird was specifically and, and quite clearly as a result of the impact of Indian miners. Impact of Indian miners actually stopping these birds getting into the nesting hollow. So here's an example of a 25% only because of, uh, of this uh, Indian miner. The red moustache fruit dove is now extinct. Miners were implicated in the extinction of this bird on the French Polynesia. May Seychelles, May Seychelles magpie robin, very few birds of these were left on one of the islands, uh, ten, 10 birds, uh, I think it was. Uh, once they started minor control activity on this island, that was the first, first uh, group of fledgings, that, or chicks that fledged in uh, eight years. Uh, so again, only because of miners being removed. Cats were there, rats were there. Eco parakeet. Now this is the bird that Susanna was talking about earlier on this morning. This bird is now very critically endangered. 40 birds left. Once they started uh, trapping miners on Tahiti, the, the chicks of this uh, bird uh, were fledging. And last year, the first time ever, 10 monarchs were fledged. fledged. Uh, and that, rose, that increased the population by 25% a really significant uh, increase in birds, but also very instructive about the impact of these uh, miners on this particular bird. And the same with the long-billed reed warbler in Tahiti as well. This international experience has been replicated and not being heralded in Australia. Now we have miners as the most common bird, or one of the largest uh, populations of birds in Sydney, Melbourne, Cairns. Used to be high in Canberra, not so much now. Here in this area, these are the birds that we are concerned about. We heard this morning about, uh, from uh, one of the speakers about the superb parrot uh, starting to breed in Mulligan's Flat. Mul uh, Tony Peacock mentioned that. Mulligan's Flat on the edge of the new suburb satellite city of Gungarland. And we're now finding miners are encroaching on Mulligan's Flat Reserve, uh, Mulligan's Reserve and taking over nesting hollows. This, is, this bird is a rare and endangered species uh, in uh, this area. I mentioned before about eastern and crimson rosellas and how they, how they handle the, in, uh, uh, the increase of miners in their area. These are the non-iconic uh, fauna that we tend to overlook. These are four rare and endangered species in this southern New South Wales region. Uh, the photos uh, aren't particularly good, but these are the four species that have been at the basis for us being concerned about overgrazing by, uh, by um, uh, kangaroos, eastern grey kangaroos. Uh, and the bottom right, the Kubrama raspy cricket has to have the best name of any insect you can think of. But in terms of the impact of these uh, miners on these uh, uh, critters, the Perugia flightless grasshopper is dead easy for miners to pick up. Uh, one of our members uh, observed a flock of 40 Indian miners on the uh, grasslands on Mount Taylor, which is the southern part of Canberra, hoovering up all the flightless grasshoppers. Because they're flightless, they don't have much chance to get away. So these are the concerns that we have, not just about birds, not just about mammals, but also about insects and uh, uh, skinks. Kate also mentioned that there is a potential for miners to impact on the breeding uh, opportunities for, for gang gangs. And her research also showed that they restricted the opportunities for, uh, for, for kookaburras and others. 
But the bottom list of birds, bottom uh, bunch of birds, these are the ones that people report as missing from their gardens when miners of any numbers come into their region. And these are the ones that aggravate people uh, most. Well, there's a human risk, human health uh, dimension to this as well. Indian miners, like starlings, actually have high infestations, potentially high infestations of bird mites. And there's been a number of reports now uh, to us and to uh, uh, University of Sydney about uh, uh, mites affecting people. But there's also a concern on the human health dimension in terms of their droppings. Uh, and this is a concern around scraps being left around outdoor cafes and stuff like that. So we're conscious of that. But there's also a more alarming uh, issue, I think, in terms of human health. Because these birds are commensal birds, they live in close uh, proximity to humans. If, in, if bird flu ever gets into Australia, these, like feral pigeons, are likely to be the vector that moves bird flu from the avian population into the human population. I guess it's at that stage that governments might start taking a bit more notice. But because they build scrappy nests, uh, there is a possibility, not to overplay it, but a possibility of uh, the scrappy nests in the roof uh, cavities uh, being a fire danger. And we had that 30, 40 years ago where I come from in South Australia. We used to focus on that in terms of sparrows, or well, spoggies we used to call them then. Uh, and they probably do still in South Australia. Where's Peter Bird? Uh, but the scrappy nests can be a, a fire risk. Horticultural uh, agricultural pest. Jackie Stoll will know this. There's uh, traps uh, in the Murrumbateman uh, wineries. Uh, the wineries, the, the vineyards, are a big attractant for both starlings and miners. And what uh, Jackie uh, and the people from Murrumbateman Landcare Group have found, and the vinerons, is that trapping uh, in the period when the grapes are about ripe uh, is the most successful time for trapping. But the impact on the productivity of vineyards can be quite significant, as it is for soft fruit crops, uh, apricots and uh, strawberries and things like that. Well, miners have a number of characteristics, which Peter Bird mentioned this morning, which really lend themselves to trapping and really lend themselves to community activity. Now, a lot of, most pests, we have to rely on government government agencies to deal with because of the nature and characteristics of those pests. But miners have a number of characteristics that lend themselves to being uh, controlled by communities. And again, I'll just uh, go through some of these that Peter mentioned earlier on. They're sedentary. They don't extend very quickly, very far, very, very, far, very quickly. And the fact that it took 100 years and then deliberate uh, dispersal into Australia, in, into Canberra, again indicates this point. They are commensal, so they live and associate with people, so they are around where we are. They are social in terms of they flock together, and that characteristic means that when you have a, a decoy bird or a trap bird in a trap, uh, that will draw others, others to the trap. They are certainly unpopular. And they're unpopular both because of that conspicuous noise, uh, but also because of the fouling uh, of, um, of their backyards. They're conspicuous, as Peter said as well, in your face, distinctive, and people don't like that. Uh, again, Peter, Peter West's uh, photo there. Now, those minor characteristics, together with some proven techniques for control, really mean that they are as highly susceptible to strategic control. And that's what we have done here in Canberra, and that's what a number of other community groups and local governments have been doing up and down the eastern seaboard. I think there are probably three models, three organisational models for Indian minor control. You have the local government managed programs, you have community initiated programs, and you have the combination of the two where you draw on the strengths of both the local government and the community. Now, tackling the problem is the same irrespective of what those three models are. It's about raising public awareness. It's about reducing the feeding opportunities that miners have. So we tell people, keep your dog food and cat food inside. Better control of waste at restaurants and cafes. And for, for 
for retirement villages, don't throw that bread out. I uh, think you're going to feed magpies and uh, other birds. You're feeding you're feeding miners as well. The last one is very hard to deal with because people like to associate with birds, and in retirement homes, a miner can be as good as a pigeon, can be as good as a magpie. Reduce the nesting opportunities. Block up cavities in your roof. Miners see human constructions, and Daryl will talk to us a bit about this later on, human constructions as ideal nesting sites. Reduce roosting opportunities, and this is about removing those these dense foliage conifers, uh, pencil pines. Promote planting of suitable gardens, same point really, and then a removal program, a need a knockdown program. So our program is, I guess, the community dimension of this uh, control approach. Uh, councils are controlling it in a number of ways through trapping integrated by themselves or with the community. But in terms of our group here, we started this program in 2006 and it grew out of the local bird watchers group uh, and we were concerned about the perceived impact of miners on rosellas and other hollow nesting birds and the fact they were driving birds out of backyards. Very quickly though, we found that the community broadly didn't like these birds, not because they saw necessary an environmental threat, but because of all those other characteristics. Noisy, raucous, fouling their backyards, things like that, in your face, the strutting around the shopping centres. So there were a num num number of other characteristics of miners that turned people off. But for us, primarily, we have been concerned about the impact of miners on the uh, uh, other native wildlife. So we've had a, developed a strategy, and this is a strategy that other community groups are following as well. Raise public awareness, try and reduce their growth and spread by cutting out their breeding and feeding opportunities and roosting opportunities. Have a, a knockdown program, and essentially that really does mean a trapping program and try and involve as many people as you can and support uh, other communities. We, this community action approach has really been very successful in this town. Uh, and it's also been very successful up and down the East Coast uh, as well. We, as you can see, have quite a number of people. We've given out um, over 1,300 traps over 600, almost 700 of which have been made by the guys in the jail and uh, the minister this morning was obviously quite proud of that. Uh, but not everybody is trapping uh, at the moment. We might only have now 200 people who are actively trapping. Uh, that's about the number of people that re give their re monthly reports back. And that's probably because the trappers who've been trapping for a while have removed what they've seen as the conspicuous birds in their area and have put the trap away in their garage. Uh, but nonetheless, they've uh, added to uh, the totals that we've um, uh, delivered. Well, the actions also involve, um, well, this is, uh, I guess, a bit more of the background trapping. Trapping can have a very positive local impact. Now, whether it has an impact across the landscape really does depend on how many traps you have out in the landscape. Uh, and, it, and those people who are trapping adjacent to nature reserves, obviously you're drawing birds in from the nature reserve, so you can have some impact there as well. But the landscape impact can only really be when you have a large-scale trapping program. Uh, we have this arrangement with the RSPCA. Let's hope it continues after, Mar uh, after uh, they observe this, uh, this film this morning. Um, but we have been very conscious of the need to get some science and science-based evidence behind our program. While the community has all this anecdotal evidence and they have a lived experience uh, for moving government, and we heard from Martin this morning, there is quite rigid constraints on how the scientific advisers to government can actually respond to, uh, to this issue. They do need some scientific evidence to support the case against miners. So we really do want to have and encourage more of this science uh, uh, onto this bird. And it's brilliant that uh, Andrea and Marie and uh, uh, Nicholas and others are uh, working on these things as well. Miner scan for us is really important. Uh, and the difficulty we have is getting people to actually log on to this. Every time people get a trap, we give them all the material from, uh, from Peter West. I don't know how many of those people bothered to actually register. I must admit, I don't. 
The big question then is, are we having an impact? Now, we can gauge this in a couple ways. First is the reports from the, the, the trappers themselves. And what they consistently tell us is that small birds are back in their gardens. Rosellas, galahs are back in nesting boxes. There's no mess, there's no fouling of their patios. Hang on. Oh, well, there's peace. <laughs> but the, the, little, the real clincher for us, though, is the garden bird survey of the Canberra Ornithologist Group. You can see here where we started trapping uh, as an organisation in February 2006. Bef before we started trapping, Indian miners were the third most common bird in Canberra. Over the successive years, they've now dropped down to the, third, the 20th most common bird in Canberra. Up at this point here, 4.98 birds were seen every, on average every week of every year of the year by the, trap, the, the uh, surveyors, the 70, 80, 110 surveyors of the Canberra Ornithologist Group. That's up here, 4.98. Down here, the maximum number of Indian miners on average that people see within 100 metres of their backyard every week of the year that's averaged is 1.3. Now, the impact of those reduction is quite remarkable. Hands up anybody who actually saw an Indian miner coming from the airport to here, or from your motel to here. Ten, nine, ten years ago, every one of you would have had both hands up. The trapping program has worked remarkably here, and it's re worked remarkably because of this link between the community action program, the promotion by uh, environmental groups, uh, ABC Radio, and people like that, Tony Peacock, etc., promoting the, the, the need. Now, I wanted to talk about, while we've had this community approach, there is also possibilities, particularly in New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland, we have a different situation here. We don't have local government. We have the ACT government, uh, and they support us uh, brilliantly by uh, uh, having the, the guys in the jail make traps for us and giving us, uh, in this last year, some uh, money to uh, provide the materials for the traps. Uh, but there are strengths between bringing together local government and the community. And we hear, we'll hear later on from Wollongong uh, and from Hawkesbury how that's worked and Courtney's here from Yurubadala, uh, and there's others as well, Windsor Caribbean, etc., and um, uh, a few others from Sydney as well. So we hear about that that connection between the community and uh, local government. But I think there are strengths that both can bring to this approach for controlling miners. The council's involvement adds some legitimacy to to this exercise. It ensures that the, the community broadly regards this as a a, a sensible, a reasonable and a sound approach to dealing with a pest animal. And the council, through their rate notices, etc., can actually provide very quick information out to the community. We're lucky here in Canberra, we have a radio station, we have uh, TV stations dedicated to this region. But if you're in Sydney, if you're in Melbourne, if you're in Brisbane, you have to rely on the major daily and the major uh, radio and TV stations. Miners getting a, getting a voice on those media outlets are very limited. So in places like Canberra, Wollongong, Newcastle, etc., uh, uh, you, you do have your own uh, media outlet, but for others, the councils really can provide that really useful and very quick education uh, access. Community action has some real positives. It means you can have many traps. As I said, here in Canberra, over 1,300 traps have been provided to people in the community. And that large trapping effort means, in fact, you can catch a lot, bird, a lot of birds. Because the community is building and, and managing the traps, it's low cost to government. In fact, it's virtually no cost to government apart from initial facilitation. It shares the responsibility between government and the community particularly in case of uh, public liability issues. And the upshot is you have a high impact but a low cost to council. 
I think the resistance by a lot of councils to being involved in, in Indian minor control is they see this as just like weeds. It's a never ending pit uh, of resource need. But if you in fact can engage the community in this program, then you're going to uh, be able to get a bigger bang for the very limited buck that they put into it. The various elements that the council can do to facilitate uh, this integrated program, this initial uh, public education I mentioned, hold the public meeting. The meeting then forms the committee of com the community uh, committee and they identify who might be coordinators for suburbs and towns. The community action group then takes over the responsibility. They are responsible for making, owning, operating the traps. Uh, they operate the network of coordinators that then links through to a single person in the council. They promote and encourage community education and involvement and Laura and Kevin Noble and Julia Gibson will uh, help us understand how that goes. And they can maintain the capture databases and undertake the, the surveys. That's all valuable work in terms of the minor control program. But the keys to community action for community group are these. We need to build up, if you want to have a community group involved, either with, by itself or with the, uh, the local government, the community organisation needs to build a network of important and prominent people. That can be the universities, RSPCA, bird watcher groups, etc. We need to have an aware and a concerned public. So public awareness raising is really important. And that can be through the champions, the media, uh, the Minor Matters Bulletin and websites and stuff like that. And we need to tap into the public loathing of miners. But people, if they are going to be involved and maintain involvement, need to have a sense of worth in the activities, in the contribution that they are making. And that means we need to tell the success stories. They need to believe that what they're doing is valuable. So we need to be continually identifying for them what are the, the, the threats posed by miners. And a good outlet uh, for getting information out to the community is the Minor Matters Bulletin that we uh, churn out every few months. Now, if we get the community involved, it needs to have easy, practical and low, low cost uh, activities. So trapping, of simple, easy to use traps are fine. Costly alternatives, buying a manufactured trap for $400 is just a turn off. Disposal needs to be quick, humane uh, and stress free. We need to provide regular feedback to members and that's where the websites and minor matter of bulletins are important. And we need to recognise that like any other community groups, there's a high drop off rate. Volunteers drop off very quickly once they've had initial success or if they in fact don't, well men particularly, if they don't catch miles in the first two days, they're likely to put the trap away. It's women uh, that really persist and we know that's probably a reflection of uh, women being a bit more uh, uh, concerned than uh, men generally. But it needs to have a low administration load on the organisation. If you have your community group, you can't burden them with a lot of detail. So for our group, we give traps away. We don't sell them because that means we'd be running a business. We don't have an ABN. We don't uh, deal with a tax office. We give away traps. People give us a donation. And that really works well as a low administrative burden. Now, this is a poem that's out on the foyer. And I'll let you uh, read that uh, later on over, over afternoon tea. But uh, C.J. Dennis wrote this as one of the, uh, the, the poems about native birds, or birds rather, in gardens. And I won't, uh, I won't talk and I certainly won't sing it. These are our contact details. Uh, you'll see it on our website and uh, lots of information about there. And I might just uh, close off there.